Hello and welcome. On behalf of Waverley Council, it's my pleasure to join with you for the NIB Presents Climate and Cultural Legacies, a conversation with Delia Falconer. Um, my name is Rebecca Giggs. I'm an author from the west coast of Australia. I'm speaking to you tonight from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation in Sydney. Waverley Council, the conveners of this event, are located where Gadigal and Bidjigal country connects in the east of the city. As with all Zoom events, I'm conscious that we're coming here together from disparate regions and that it can seem as though we're all just a kind of cosmopolitan array, heads in rooms. Um, but for those of us who are in Australia, we're united in this context, and that is that we are on Aboriginal land, always was, always will be, and our respect and our deep indebtedness flows in that direction to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, and elders, um, particularly those who may be joining us this evening. A quick word about the NIB to give you a little bit of background to tonight's dialogue. The Mark and Yvette Moran NIB Literary Award is Waverley Council's Literary Prize. It's presented annually. It's um, perhaps the only prize in Australia that celebrates writing that's anchored in really excellent research. And as such, it recognises the work done by an author to engage in the public sphere um, through fact finding and synthesis. It's also a really long standing prize. It's been around for three decades now. Um, the NIB um, organising <laughs> committee have asked me to uh, remind everybody that nominations remain open for this year's prize. Um, and with a prize pool of over $28,000, if you're a publisher or an author, this is definitely one that should be on your radar. Um, it closes on the 20th of June. Tonight, it's my pleasure to join with Delia Falconer, who is a previous NIB winner. Um, my own book the, um, called Fathoms, The World in the Whale took out the award in 2020. Ramona Caval was supposed to be with us this evening. Her book, A Letter to Leia, travels to our deep past and near future, which I'm showing on the screen here now, um, was a finalist in the 2021 prize listing. But unfortunately, we don't have Ramona with us this evening. Um, she is recovering from surgery and she sends her apologies. But you can buy Ramona's book, Delia's book, and my book, if you feel so moved to do the trifecta <laughs> by going to the Gertrude and Alice Bookstore Cafe, which is tonight's book selling partner. Um, Gertrude and Alice, their web address is, as you would imagine, Gertrude and A-N-D, alice.com.au. So please do um, support your um, Australian independent booksellers and the authors that you'll hear from tonight. So it's a slightly more intimate conversation, um, but to introduce Delia to you in proper, I first met Delia's mind through her writing when one of my university professors accosted me after a lecture um, when I was an undergrad and um, gave me The Service of Clouds, Delia's first novel. Um, my professor then, Tanya Dalziel, thought that I'd really benefit from coming to understand a bit more about Australian atmospherics, as she put it. Um, the Service of Clouds is a completely weather-drenched novel. Those of you who've read it will know it features photographs of the sky and of meteorology. It features storms and lightning, um, the duskiness of the lungs as well. So it's from this kind of place that I suppose my introduction to Delia's interest in um, atmosphere and weather commences. Since producing that book, Delia has gone on to write historical fiction, literary criticism, much of it in the Sydney Review of Books that um, uh, has been very kind of virally shared around. Um, she's written a wonderful work of psychogeography about the city of Sydney. Um, that book was in the New South series of city books. But she's come um, in tonight to discuss the essay collection, Signs and Wonders, Dispatches from a Time of Beauty and loss. This is a book about environmental conscience. It's about living in a super saturated digital world at the same time as the natural world is losing its luster and thinning. Um, and it's also about mothering, I think, in a time of a rapidly foreclosing future. 
Delia and I are going to speak for around about half an hour, 40 minutes, somewhere in that ballpark before I'm then going to open it up to questions. We'll do questions this way. Um, I'm going to ask you to write your question out in the Q&A section um, of the webinar on Zoom. Um, you will, you can do that throughout the conversation. So don't feel that you need to wait to the end moment to put it, put that information there. So if something occurs to you, um, you know, formulate your question then and put it into the Q&A. There's also an uprate function, I think, on that, um, on that facility on Zoom. So if you see a question that you really like, or you, you, um, you know, you would have liked to put it that way, um, then please also uprate popular questions. Um, I'll then turn to those questions and I'll ask them kind of on your behalf. So um, please make sure you also leave your name so that I can be sure to indicate who it is who's asked the question. Final point of logistics. Um, this conversation uh, is also, you can engage with it via social media. Um, if you are a Twitter aficionado, there are hashtags. Uh, the hashtag is niblit. 2022 so that's 2022 so n-i-b-l-i-t 2022 hashtag or you can use the hashtag nib award n-i-b award um delia falcona is also on twitter her handle is her name um i am also on twitter my handle is my name we're not too difficult to find so please um if you want to cycle us into that conversation obviously we won't be doing talking and checking social media in tandem, but it's always lovely to kind of have that capture afterwards. Okay, Delia, welcome. I think that the best place for us to start is to sketch out some of the big gestures of the collection. Um, with other authors, I would ask something like, what was the point of instigation for writing this book? Um, but it seems to me on reading Signs and Wonders that rather than trying to pin down a particular political or personal moment of agitation, you're trying to capture a mood and it's a really pervasive mood. So I wanted to ask you about the emotional temperature of this book. Is it written from a place of sorrow? Is it written from a place of anger? Let's start there. All right. Um... Well, thanks for that introduction as well. I, um, I didn't know that story. Um, obviously, I'm a very big fan of your book as well, so yes, all the synergies are, are, are very lovely tonight. Um, but, but one of the things I was thinking about um, was that when I wrote that first novel, um, which is about the clouds kind of losing their wonder, really, in, in the Blue Mountains of, of New South Wales, one of the things that was on my mind was um, John Ruskin's Storm Cloud of the 20th Century, which is this essay that he wrote in, um, you know, in his, in his mad years, I think it was about 1900 or 1901, he wrote that essay and he said that there was this, the clouds had become more looming, they'd become darker and um, that there'd actually been this physical change in the clouds and this was about, for him it was less an issue of environmental damage than it was about um, kind of, you know, the, the, the Victorians losing their way, I suppose, and that era um, sort of darkening morally and um, in terms of its, uh, you know, I suppose the, the sense of possibilities. And it just, it just struck me that that's, you know, such an enormous sort of circle and, and irony there that, um, you know, my current book comes out of this um, sense that we are also, um, you know, in... Um, you know, looking at, at uh, a short, a shortened future that we are looking at, um, you know, that we have this palpable sense that the air itself, the air that we breathe, the, the incredible self-maintaining atmosphere of the earth is, uh, you know, is, is um, in danger. But I guess the, so, so you know, we, we the, this, I guess, you know, this sense of, um, understanding that we are altering the planet and we, you know, I use we very advisedly, we'll just talk about that later, but that humans are responsible for and we're entwined and meshed in the world in profound, almost unthinkable ways, which is, you know, I know also the, the subject of, of, of your um, book, Fathoms, um, you know, that's sort of with us. But um, so my, my, my book certainly comes out of this sense of, 
um, you know, of great alarm, but um, it's, you know, it's called a, a you know, it's subtitled is, um, you know, um, dispatches from a time of beauty and uh, beauty and loss. And one of the things that I really wanted to explore was the was the way in which we are also, um, you know, things also we're in a time of of wonders. They're sometimes worrying wonders or or, or terrible wonders. But um, we're at a moment where um, you're at a phase of of, of sort of in um, of potential catastrophe that's still very, very beautiful. And so I wanted to capture that, that sort of knife edge feeling that we're, that we're on and that sense that, um, you know, there is still, um, you know, things are still salvageable. There is still a, 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 you know, an element of hope, but things are on the lag. <laughs> and so it's this double consciousness I wanted to capture of being in a moment when, um, you know, what is beautiful and is wondrous, um, are often spectacularly strange um, from shifts in our weather to mega lightning to, you know, uh, prehistoric creatures popping out of, of, of permafrost and so on. Um, we're on this kind of lag in which there's all, you know, this, this, is, this is very much in danger of, of, of slipping away. But it also the beauty may actually be being maybe something that's that's coming out of this kind of unraveling that's underway. So I really wanted to capture this feeling of um, the, the great amb ambiguity um, and an intense changefulness um, of, of being in this moment, this kind of cusp moment where you know it's almost like the but it's almost. It's almost baroque. It's almost um, it's very it's very colourful. It's very spectacular. We know more about the natural world, perhaps, as we as it risks slipping out of our grasp than we ever knew, and and it becomes more spectacular and more um, intricate. <laughs> and at the same time, um, that that those wonders are things that we have to perhaps look at very carefully and intimately um, and with great concern mm -hmm. because um, they are also wrapped up in this terrible story of, of global unravelling that's that's on way, underway around us. Mm. So um, the word that I want to hold on through all of that is mm. enchantment because, mm. you know, you, you when we think about those clouds in the Victorian era really... Um, once being, you know, the old fashioned way of speaking about them would be pathetic fallacy, you know, this poetic technique where the clouds represented something spiritual or godly. And then they get kind of denuded of that meaning and brought into industry and filled with particulate and smog and what have you. But it seems to me that one of the things you're saying in Science and Wonders is that there's this new emergence of um, the the sort of mysterious the opacity again the, the enchanted again mm, even mm. though we know so much more mm, mm. um yeah is that sort of yes, where well, the we've, we've we've kind of yeah we've, we've i mean the history of the air fascinates me and i think that's one of the things that's always been there in sort of everything i've written in some way i've been fascinated by atmosphere and we have gone through this trajectory of um, you know, the, 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 the heavens being apparently infinite, God-given, and then we've started to understand them more as a mix of CO2 and, um, you know, sort of um, started to understand things like the, the Gulf Stream and, and the effects of sea ice on winds and so on. So we've come to this very scientific understanding. But we're now at this um, point, and, and you're absolutely right, it is a point of, of, um, of, of kind of dangerous enchantment, I suppose, where... Uh, now it's it's I suppose the other thing I wanted to capture in this book is that we're still at that point where you know we're seeing spectacular and strange things but we're not quite sure if you know if what if what we're seeing is being caused by us and I know that again you know you capture that as well I was, I was rereading your book um, <laughs> this, in this last week and you speak about seeing you book start your book with a whale you know, a whale that's beached and is dying on the beach. And everyone's coming up with these theories for what might have caused that, that whale to beach. And a lot of them are quite, you know, um, scientifically plausible. And others are to do with, you know, people are talking about 
um, from memory, pardon me if it's wrong, but satellites and, and all sorts of other um, occurrences that might have might have happened. And I think that's the sort of feeling that we very often have at the moment where, you know, um, you know, some of the things I write about, things like, you know, mighty hailstorms, um, where all these these once in a hundred year weather events that we are seeing, which are probably very likely <laughs> caused by um, by um, global heating and by deep disturbances to the atmosphere, but we don't kind of quite know. Um, and so, uh, and, and again, that's... Um, it's so like, entangled, isn't it? Yes, like in the sense yes. that, you know, when we talk about smog in particular, that there's a way that you could put that under a microscope and really see the industrial mm. products, mm. you know, like that mm. is a, mm. the output mm. of a factory. Mm. But now you see, you know, and I know this book was written in the lee of the bushfires, mm. thinking about that idea of the history of the air, that now we have this air that's full of organic particulate, you know, mm. like it's full of ash, it's yes. full of burnt trees and carbon, but the human accelerant to that disaster mm. is mm. less conspicuous in some mm. way mm. Mm. and and you know some of those uh you know one of the things i write about um again that is kind of conjured out of dry air and dry land are um some of the things that occurred in the 2018 droughts in europe um and so again it's it's um it's a bizarre thing to live through that we, we're sort of seeing this stuff that seems so often um you know, unimaginable, but here it is. It's unthinkable, but here it is. And as one one result of the the European droughts um, in two thousand and eighteen was all sorts of things appearing. You know, appearing out of snow melt and and so on, and hunger stones appearing out of rivers that had recorded droughts in the fourteen hundreds. And and you know, stones say, you know, if you can read this this weep, so we've got these voices emerging out of mm. prior emergencies. Um, There's a weird way in which that's a kind of literature as well, you know, yes. in the sense that it's sort of like trying to jump over future generations to right. another event catastrophe window, you know. So written addressing an audience that isn't um, knowable but, but you know, mm. but nonetheless can be empathised with, you know. Like if you read right. this weep, you're saying to that person, like, we, we have been where you are now yes. and th there is pain you know, like yes, that's and it's, it's it's eerie, it's moving, um, yeah. and but then there's there are also those um, examples where it feels as if the almost as if the the earth is speaking, or that the that the other voices are being conjured out of the the earth. And and for me, the eeriest um, of these examples is parch marks, where um, so in that drought period, suddenly the ground was so dry that the old um, footsteps of buildings, Neolithic villages, um, old airfields, old um, Tudor manors were all appearing in bright green out of, um, out because the, 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 the land around them was so yellowy and dry. And mm. so you had this, some, and some of them look like, almost like writing from the earth, especially the, the, the aerial photographs of the, um, of the old Neolithic villages emerging from, from the earth. And on the one hand, um, it was very interesting to watch the footage because again, it's this moment of, well, how do we, how do we interpret these? How do we, how do we respond and, 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 and read um, what's actually literally emerging from the earth? And, and some reports were, um, you know, would start saying, well, we're in this unprecedented drought and, you know, this um, slightly horrifying thing is happening, but hey, isn't it great for aerial, <laughs> aerial archaeologists? And, you know, there's a New Yorker piece I write about that kind of, and, and you just see these, it's kind of the, the double reality that we live in at the moment, where you see this swerve from, hey, here's this unprecedented thing, which is probably due to us, mm -hmm. um, to um, this fascination, and that's something that I, you know, I, I write about quite a bit in the book, this sort of enchantment of our phones, of our feeds, of all this stuff kind of just coming at us, one, one thing after the other. Um, you know, we, we live in this very strange moment of, of um, eerie, uh, eerie wonders and, and incredible change, constant change becoming normalised. Um, in the way that it, it passes so swiftly through our lives. And so I wanted to just kind of sit with that, I guess, because it's going to change change so much. Um, and, and it is so swift to just kind of take 
kind of a good couple of years, about 2018 to, to, to 2020, um, is the kind of, the, I suppose, the crux of the book. And, and sit with those moments and think, well, wait, what do they mean? Let's let's sort of try and slow time down here a bit and just um, mm. um, and sit with them in the, in the same way that you you take a whale for the world and you sit with the you know with the whale and, and think about all the the meanings that um, that that you know spiral out from those you know from from the the whale that is now so, whose life is so incredibly entwined with with human life now. Mm. so there's no sort of it's you don't quite have that sense of being able to look at nature from a distance anymore I suppose that's the eeriness as well that it's we are so as you say so entwined so caught up with the natural world and too too close for comfort literally (laughs) um I I do want to ask you about the digital um Mm. particularly because I think that's one thing that um you know, a lot of environmental authors shy away from thinking about the way in which our digital bubble is shaping our engagement with nature. But before we get there, temporality. So, you know, we, we have this event, the parch marks emerge, and there's a kind of revealing of ancientness through something that's, um, you know, also potentious of the future. As a writer who works across a number of genres and disciplines, is there something about narrative nonfiction, do you think, that enables you to deal with those kind of temporalities and, and big scales as well, um, like geophysical scales? Mm-hmm. Was the reason you kind of tackled this topic head on through nonfiction? Mm. Um, well, I think, uh, you know, at, at a very simple level, um, I think nonfiction is faster to write than, than fiction. Um, but fiction is such a, uh, it's, you are looking for a well-made story of some sort and perhaps the dimensions of a, of a novel, even a generational novel, aren't going to allow you to kind of quite capture what's going on. I mean, there have been some, some novelists who are making a very good stab of it, like James Bradley and Clade, who takes um, descendants of one, um, one couple and sort of takes them through sort of centuries of climate change, although many of the things that he predicts as being in the far future in that book are actually all coming true. So ask him not to write another <laughs> one for a while. No one um, wants James and Crystal Ball anymore. Yes. The big floods, the plague, everything that's in that book have, um, you know, that were scheduled for quite some time later have um, come to pass. But um, with nonfiction, I think, you know, especially these days, we, where we, we, use, we write out of the self and we use, use the self as a scale, it just seemed um, important to me to, you know, these, these are such unthinkable layers and there are so many different layers to, to, to what's happening at the moment because, of course, um, you know, we're also being haunted by deep time. Um, constantly we so we, we're haunted by a future that seems to kind of you know both receive you know sort of look like an abyss sometimes and also um you know kind of looks like a cul-de-sac sometimes as well and then we are constantly you know we've got these 50,000 year old prehistoric horses emerging out of ice we are haunted literally by our um, fossil fuels heating our environment um, and so we've got the, you know, these different sort of layers to try to fit those into a, into a novel, into fiction, seems like a very hard call, but, you know, counterintuitively being able to write as oneself um, is, you know, I, I felt kind of allowed, and, and as a mother, as a, you know, of children who are also looking at, um, you know, a very, you know, very different sort of, um, future and very big major changes occurring in their lifetime mm. that allowed me to have a um, you know I could take little sort of um, almost core samples I suppose to use mm. a, a, a geological metaphor through um, through um, you know this period that some people are calling the the um, you know the great the great acceleration so you know all the graphs of as you all know of our use of planet's resources, um, whether it's, you know, CO2 um, um, in the atmosphere, um, deforestation, uh, um, um, acidification of the ocean, um, you sort of see everything start, the graphs start to kind of go up like this about 1950. And then about 1990, they just, it's called the holistic effect, they just 
all sort of start going up and, and off scale. And I, I realised that my own life, I'm born in 1966, um, you know, is covers a good, goodly span of, of that time. So again, my, my constant um, aim in these essays was to take a core sample of um, beauty and loss or beauty and terror um, through and also to, um, to, to kind of keep, the, keep that measure of, um, of, a, of, of a single human life um, as, a, as a way of sort of trying to, to find some sort of passage through um, really enormous, um, really challenging ideas and, and, you know, a present in which there's just, you know, a huge amount going on. Yeah, I really felt that in the essay on coal, which you have your children in Parliament House and you have your imagining of their futurity, their lifespan, but then you have coal and coal's legacy and coal's kind of deep past. Can you just, as a way of articulating those ideas in a really concrete way, can you tell us a little bit about that essay? Sure. Yeah, and, um, and maybe also, you know, the, the sort of fragmentary nature of it, like um, what the, the structure of it was quite sure. I mean, that's, um That essay is a, um, what people call a lyric essay these days. It's different to most of the others in the book in that it is a kind of a, a collage, a patchwork. So lyric essays tend not to, you know, argue from one point to the next, but they tend to just, you know, use a lot of space and place um, uh, paragraphs almost like stanzas against each other. And... I, that that is a um, you know I call it an irrational history of coal because I wanted to um, you know on the one hand we have coal power so sort of normalized especially here in Australia around our very many mining endeavors and our, our reliance on on that as a as an export uh, and I wanted to kind of um, make it strange and bring that enchantment of, of coal back, I suppose, um, onto the page. And so, but I also wanted to, you know, you can get so lost in the statistics, you can get so lost in the, um, you know, in all that material about the fact that, you know, we've been in the stable 12,000 year Holocene period. Um, and, you know, now we're starting to push out of global warming, the age of coal, you know, the fact that we put down the Carboniferous period and you know, here, here, here that period is, is you know, those, those peat bogs have kind of come back again to sort of bite us as we, as we burn them in the form of, of um, global heating. That sort of stuff, I think, you know, I read it and, you know, I care desperately about it, but there is that sense in which you can just kind of go down the, the rabbit hole of those sort of statistics. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I've done in that essay is um, when you go to Parliament House there um, and, and, and you have kids to entertain, they hand them at the information desk this little booklet and it's the kids' trail um, to the Parliament House and they say, go and find Sean the Prawn <laughs> in the um, Granatello Nero, um, so black marble foyer. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to spoil it, say exactly where it is, but anyway, my, my kids and I went and we found it. And it's this little, um, it's this little white fossil. It looks and, and this, the, the Granatello Nero um, just put down where, where Belgium is um, now, you know, in the shallow seas that used to cover, um, you know, cover, cover Europe. Um, it's, it's mad looking stuff. It's fantastic. It looks like looking at an ultrasound screen or, you know, it's full of kind of little bits of sort of white, white noise. Um, of all the little bits of carbon, I guess, of, of little animal skeletons that are caught in the rock. And then there's this one thing that looks like a, looks like a prawn. Uh, but, um, and so I start from that as the kind of the, 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 the origin point for the essay. And around that, I try to wind, you know, this mad world history of coal. You know, the mad, just the, the fact that... Um, Coal is the lucky object. That really that's right. Me. That's like, right. Good, good luck charm. Mm. That's right. That that people um, that it has this mad history of of you know being seen as a um, yes you say like a lucky charm that bur burglars would carry girls would put under their pillows to um, you know to dream of of um, potential lovers and and so on. Um, but you know, we also have this history in Australia that it's so it's so coal centric, and I wanted to sort of bring that out in the essay as well. And and the whole essay kind of came out of that visit to um, 
to Parliament House and seeing the prawn, uh, which spoiler isn't a isn't a prawn at all, um, it's a piece of coral. So that you know, um, kind of interesting in our halls of you know halls of government and and um, and truth that we have this little story for the kids. I talk about that bit as well. Um, but uh, you know, the fact that uh, Col uh, that um, Captain Cook made his four expeditions to Australia in a um, restored Whitby cattle, so it was a so it was a repurposed um, collier, coal coal carrying boat. Um, just seems so. Um, uh, you know, it just seems like our path is is predetermined. So I kind of wanted to go back into that history as well. And so I've kind of wound this um, the kids' search for the um, for the for Sean the prawn um, and the fact that this little this this creature, this bit of an early coral garden, um, is sitting there from the Carboniferous period, meters you know about hundred meters away from where our leaders are making decisions about um, you know allowing. Uh, new mines in Queensland that you know are going to have the output of small nations um, between just a you know just a few of them that are going to be draining the um, Galilee basin or perhaps the two basins because we actually don't still fully know um, what's under underground there even though we're committing to this um, tremendous project. I wanted to kind of bring the, the and as I have with all the essays the kind of the small and the huge um, together in ways where um, you know, as much for myself as, as anyone else reading the book, that I could really kind of feel that, um, you know, to, to sort of let it have some personal traction because it's so easy to just yeah, get, uh, um, get lost in, in all the facts, I think. Yeah, I think you do that terrifically and not just the prawn as this kind of objective correlative for the story at large, but I had no idea that coal could become, you know, literally so faceted. It just the whole, all of these these histories kind of gave it a, um, yeah, just just kind of revealed new dimensions to it well, that I, I had no idea existed. The mad thing about coal that I sort of didn't know or I hadn't sort of just hadn't computed because again I hadn't sort of sat down and really looked at it was um, that each layer, each striation in coal is is a mark of sea rise. You know, mm -hmm. as the glaciers melted and um, and then reformed um, in the Carboniferous period, and then then later in a couple of subsequent periods, but mostly in the Carboniferous. Um, so each each of those layers is an indication of, of sea rise. So we kind of it's there in the object. Yeah. <laughs> you know that 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 sort of spell that that you know sort of evil spell, I suppose, is is there in the very thing that we are sort of putting, you know, putting out of our heads um, and trying to, you know, try, try not to face that that sort of story that could lead to, <laughs> could lead yes. to rise. I don't, I don't even know why I'm laughing. It's just, but it's just the, um, you know, it's just of the many ironies. That's just ast astonishing that, you know, you can look at it and you can actually see the history of, you know, literally thousands of, of, of small sea rise inund inundations. Mm. Mm. So I'm thinking about, um, you know, one of the um, parallel art forms in which <coughs> these problems have been tackled is photography. Um, just thinking about scale of environmental destruction. Mm -hmm. And one of the charges that often gets leveled at, um, you know, big environmental photographers is that they beautify disaster. And these kind of high, you, you may have seen them in like mining company boardrooms, high altitude photos of mine sites that, um, you know, rendered from such mm -hmm. a distance begin mm -hmm. to look like cells or like, you know, they, they begin to appear like something organic. Mm. At any length, I've been thinking about that question myself, just what the obligation of the writer is to avoid beautifying loss. And I think this is something that's kind of, yeah, runs through your work as like one, one big kind of like vein throughout the whole collection, that question of not just the splendor that occurs to us in these kind of miraculous events like animals coming out of the permafrost and what have you, but also to what extent, how, how do we render these things? Like, what's the aesthetic move we make? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really hard one, isn't it? I mean, I'm still, I think even having, you know, like you have written the book, I'm still sort of pondering that very much. Um, part, I think part of the impetus for the book and the way that I wrote it came out of 
becoming very impatient with um, uh, books that were very much in praise of wonder. So, you know, either wonderment in terms of nature being there to, hey, you know, we can go out and forest bathe or we can, you know, go out with nature and um, our own personal problems are, um, you know, are healed, which of course is part of, na part of nature. But um, that's kind of reducing nature, I suppose, to a certain, you know, sort of something that, you know, a commodity that renders a, a service to us in some sort of way. And the other thing that I became very impatient with, though, was, was a vein that's very strongly there in a lot of environmental writing, nature writing, um, which is to extort us to feel wonder. And if we, and if we go through the labour in reading a book of feeling wonder, um, you know, about, um, you know, about the natural world, about trees or about, you um, uh, you know, about a particular sort of animal, um, you know, that will, that will, you know, ch change the world. Now, obviously, we, you know, that's, again, part of things that we want to, you know, you need, perhaps need to have an appreciation of how things work or how amazing they are, you know, how, what an incredible self-regulating system the planet is. I mean, you have to have a fundamental faith in, in, that sort of level of planetary organisation to, you know, to want to, to do something about um, our addiction to fossil fuels and, and to try and bring that already terrifying path to global heating, you know, to try and restrain it to 1.5 or, or 2 degrees. But, um, yeah, I did feel that that wasn't so far away in some ways, from those beautiful photos that you see, there's, I write about this a bit in my book. There's a there's a magazine that I keep getting in my letterbox um, for the sin of having booked with a particular travel company. And this magazine is called um, Virtuoso Life, um, <laughs> which I always open and read because, um, uh, you know, I really, <laughs> it enrages me, I rage read it. Um, and that's all about, you know, how you can, you know, get your, still get your favourite, um, you know, you can no longer go on a cruise, but you can still get your favourite um, um, sandals from, from a particular boutique in Positano and so on. Um, but you look at, there's a particular genre in that sort of glossy travel magazine, which is to, you know, and I think we all have it a bit sort of plugged into our system now. I find it hard to resist when I take photographs myself where, you know, you'll see a, you know, uh, rad a bunch of radishes with the roots still on them in the hands of a farmer in intense, beautiful close-up. Um, um, or you'll see that wonderful little untouched or apparently untouched part of the world with a glorious sunset with a couple sort of enjoying, you know, their sort of seclusion from, um, from the rest of the world. And that, that um, you know, that is such a powerful um, sort of set of visual codes, powerful fiction that we live with and um, you know as a nature writer I think or someone who's trying to to write something that is again sort of stopping the clock in a way or, or trying to just um, take pause and you know think a bit more deeply about some of the, the sort of the huge sort of um, physical and philosophical challenges that um, this moment's bringing us it's it's really you feel the the draw of that and you're aware, I think, that, you know, for every, you know, signs, signs and wonders or fathoms that, you know, one, one puts out into the world, there's this um, incredibly strong um, iconography of, of what I call, you know, glamour. Um, and that's a kind of an enchantment that is, you know, really, um, you know, as I, I say in my book, I think that's the thing that might finish us all off is this, um, this, you know, all the things that go with that, that sort of iconography and that idea that, you know, the world that, um, you know, things can always be made over, um, that there's always a little paradise that you can escape to, that, um, you know, the world can always be made uniform and beautiful. Um, you know, I think that's a really, that's a really dangerous sort of fantasy parallel. It's, it's a fantasy world, but it's a world that we live in. Um, and so all those calls for curiosity and wonder, I think we've got to be very careful, don't, um, mm -hmm. aren't too similar. So I guess, uh, you know, to that sort of, um, you know, that don't sort of look too pretty or glamorous as well. So I guess part of, again, what I was doing by writing a 
book of essays and just kind of trying to change angles constantly was to, um, you know, to sort of, to, to look at this beauty, but to say, let's look at it very carefully and let's really try and sort of pull apart. Um, and yes, really appreciate how glorious the world is, even in its, you know, even in its, um, in, in extremis, um, even as it, is, you know, we are seeing a, an environmental unravelling, but let's not take that as a sign that everything is okay. Mm. <laughs> it's kind of like a Baroque moment, um, a very, you know, sort of technicolour moment um, of great changes that aren't going to be as, as beautiful or as lovely ahead, and that is already underway um, underneath that. So I guess that's the constant sort of tension. Mm. I, I loved in the passage where you speak about this idea of glamour, you refer to it as um, in, in the sense of it being a verb, like the, the vampire fiction version of glamour, where one gets glamoured, one gets kind of hypnotised by the, the glossy surface and fails to kind of, and, and then, you know, does something morally abject as a result. That's right, which actually comes from an old Scottish term, um, so who knew that true blood was so literary? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, um, it's an old Scottish term to glamour someone is to put them under your spell. And then yeah. you true blood if you want to, you know, suck someone's blood <laughs> and then you glamour them by looking into their, into their eyes. I think earlier in the collection as well, you, and this is just a passing mention, but it felt to me like it set up this idea of glamour. You write a little bit about the idea of shimmering, mm. the Yolongu um, term, which comes to you from the work of Deb Bird Rose, mm. which is a very different idea of the human in relation to the non-human world. Mm. So what, I mean, I understand you're a settler Australian, I'm a settler Australian, and we don't have access to the true meaning of, mm. you know, this, this um, epistemology way of understanding the world. But to you, what does shimmering represent? Mm. Um, yes, look, the de late Deborah Bird Rose's work, um, you know, I would say that, you know, I think people should go and read it. And I'm very, yes, I, yeah, I am very anxious about not wanting to um, appropriate um, this, you um, the old new idea of it's biryun is is the term for it, and it's there apparently in the, the aesthetic of cross hatching is actually an indication is is an attempt to capture this sense of shimmer, and the, and I'd like I wish I could get the the words exactly right and and, and read it out here, but um the, it's it's an idea of the world being made up of a series of shimmering pulses and interconnections, and it's that sense of the rather than you know if you think of the of glamour and that idea of the object, the, the single beautiful thing that's of such a, and then you think of shimmer versus um, <laughs> glamour. I think you know you you get a very um, it it is a very you know, glorious, very beautiful, um, you know, just from what one can, can sort of tell from, yeah. um, you know, from reading it, mediated something. through her work. But, yes, that sense that um, every, it, things are so in, interconnected and this pulse sort of moves between um, and is shared by, by all entities, as I understand it, and I think I've probably bastardised it terribly, but it's, um, yeah, I, I think her, she, she talks about that in, in, her new, in her new book that's come out, posthumously um, called Shimmer. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that, that I, you know, I'd really recommend that to, um, to anyone because she does, she's worked so, you know, in partnership with um, mostly Northern um, Territory uh, Indigenous people to, um, you know, to, to explore, you know, notions of, of, of country and, and this notion of Shimmer that I think is, um, is, such a you know it's such a privilege to um be in a country with that history that precedes mm -hmm. inundation and is still a living history that i think there's a lot more to you know to 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 learn out of that do you think there is something different about um you know settler colonial australian nature writing as against the european and american traditions mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what you think. Do um, you think because I think you've probably studied this a, a bit more than than I have. But um, I don't know that many of us would call ourselves uh, nature nature writers. I don't know that there's really that sort of tradition, you know. And, and I guess 
the other impetus for me uh, for writing this book, which was which is very firmly set in you know the Australian context, although it kind of tries to look at the world from that context, is that sense of you know you go walk into a bookstore, you walk into you know reading self of content, so on, and um, you look at all the shelves, and if there is a nature writing section, which they often this, there might be a small one here in Australia. In America, you'd go in and you'd not only see shelves of nature writing, you'd see nature writing for particular different regions. You'd see that in, in, yeah. in England as well. Um, and But you walk in and you, there's a very, it's a very odd sensation to, um, to realise that your sense of nature writing has been sort of, you know, somewhat colonised, I think, by mm-hmm. um, that, that huge set of perspectives that, you know, where, where nature is being looked at from the, from the north, you know, from the northern hemisphere, mm-hmm. um, you know, and there's been some really, there's the, you know, there are some exceptions like Amitav Ghosh's writing. I think is so exciting in the Nutmeg's Curse, but particularly in um, the Great Derangement, where he takes the perspective um, from the Indian Ocean Basin and mm-hmm. looks at. But there, but you know, there's. I think it's we're going to feel some of the effects. Um, um, as a nation first, certainly there are parts of the world that are already, and it's very uneven, um, where, um, you know, people are already feeling um, heating, biting, you know, you know, to one example, all the people who are migrating into America from Central America because of the drought, because the coffee, coffee um, plantations, the um, you know, coffee farms, the other enterprises, um, single cash crops are all failing. And that's one of the reasons uh, that, you know, we don't hear enough about of why, um, you know, why there's been such a, um, such a flow of people from the south of the states through the, through the American border. Um, uh, but, um, you know, we will, we've already had that experience with the fires of 2019 and 2020. When we had our first first actual mega fire. Um, um, uh, it was interesting the way that that was scanning overseas as a zoological catastrophe. Mm. You know, like that was. Mm. I felt you know I was out of Australia at that point, and it seemed to me that within Australia the climate narrative really leapt up out of the reporting. Mm. Mm. Um, but overseas, very much the story mm. was this is like burnt kangaroos and koalas. Mm. Mm. It just spoke to Australia as a kind of Edenic. Mm. southern nature that's full mm. of weird wonderful mm. marsupials mm. Mm. um yes i'm i'm conscious about time there's so much we could talk about and i just there's so many directions i want to go in but i do want to allow our audience to ask some questions as well um so i'm going to encourage anyone i don't as far as I can see, have any questions written down just yet. Um, If you have a burning question, please do throw it into the Q&A so that we can have a chance to direct it to Delia. Um, No question too um, simple, no question too complex. Uh, But um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Delia to read a little bit so you can get a taste of the book. Um, and also, I guess, to allow a little pause for listening, but also the formulation of questions. If we come back and we have no questions from the audience, I have a heap more. Don't worry, it won't be dead air time. So Dilly's going to read from the beginning of the bird's essay. Is that right? Yes. That's right. Um, so I do have to apologise because we do have planes going overhead. Ironically enough, um, as we talk about this topic, we talk about coal and <laughs> so I do quite near Sydney Airport and um, they're, they're sort of, booming down, um, so I, I apologise um, in advance um, if we get some rumbles. Okay, so birds. When I experienced a great loss in my early 40s, almost a year to the day after another, I went to see my mother in the family home. She wasn't a hugger or giver of advice, so instead we fed the birds. As she had when I was a child, she stood behind me in the kitchen with her shoulder propped against the back door passing slices of apple and small balls of minced meat into my hand. Each bird, apart from the snatching cookbarrows, was touchingly gentle in the way it took food from my fingers. The white cockatoos ate daintily, one-legged. The lorikeets jumped onto the sloping ramp on both feet like eager parachutists to quarrel over the apple and press the juice from the pulp with stubby tongues. Lined up on the veranda rail, the magpies cocked their heads to observe me, observe me before accepting meat precisely in their blue white beaks. They had a beautiful caroling song with a corded quality in the falling registers. But the bright eyed butcher birds 
had the most lovely song of all, a full throated piping, which I've heard compared to the Queen of the Night's aria in Mozart's Magic Flute. Over decades, a family of these little blue gray birds had come to stack their hooked meat eaters' beaks with mints, which they flew to deliver to young somewhere in our neighbor's garden, though we had never bothered to try to work out where they lived. This afternoon, when my mother and I opened the door, they landed by our side as they always had, having spotted us from their watching places. For a brief moment, surrounded by these vital creatures, I felt as if I might want to be alive. Birds have always been small agents charged with carrying the burden of our feelings simply by following the logic of their own existence. The Irish imagined puffins as the souls of priests. The ancient Romans released an eagle when an emperor died in the belief that it would conduct his soul aloft. In the Abrahamic religions, doves are given powers of revelation. We've even been inclined right up until the present to imagine birds as the souls of our recently departed return to us, if only for a moment. Even without being recruited into such labor, birds touch on our lives in small but significant ways. Once in the botanical gardens of Melbourne, a boyfriend laughed until he almost cried at the mechanical eager hopping of the tiny fairy wrens, a fact that only made me like him more. A friend tells the story of her uncle who ordered quail for the first time at a restaurant and cried when he saw it on his plate. She had a raven's heart, small and obdurate, American author Don DeLillo writes of a nun in Underworld. It is my favorite description in any novel. In Japan, where my partner and I tried to ease our sadness, the calls of crows were ubiquitous in every town. Like the low sounds of its deer, they had a subdued, almost exhausted quality, as hollow as the bells that are rattled to call the oldest spirits to its Shinto temples. In 1975, when his first wife left him, Masahise Fukase began to photograph these birds, which he had seen from the window of his train. He would keep taking their pictures on a hilltop torii at dusk, grouped on the budding branches of a bare tree in flying silhouette for 10 years. Ravens would become one of the most famous books of modern photography, hailed as a masterpiece of mourning. While some people see the birds in his photos as symbols of loneliness, I see them as embodiments of pure intention. I work and photograph to stop everything, Picasso said, as if fulfilling a prophecy he would spend the last two decades of his life in a coma after falling down the stairs at his favorite bar. Yet for all our emotional investment in them, we've never treated birds particularly well. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, but you know, the amazing thing is that um, we sold my mother's house after, after she died. The essay's partly about the death of my mother a couple of years ago. But um, in that area, um, on the, in the north shore of Sydney, there's been this resurgence of echidnas and um, <laughs> pythons appearing in the neighbourhood. And you know, there's one just on the Facebook site just a couple of days ago outside the, the fence of our old house. And they, they hadn't appeared there since I was a I was a kid. My mum had been in mum had been in that house for 47 years. Um, and again, it was one of those moments of, of this time where you find yourself thinking, oh, is this a great thing because we are you know, because, um, you know, we're looking after the after nature a bit better, maybe we're using fewer pesticides, being a bit more sort of green and conscious, or is it because we've impinged more on all that <laughs> bushland that's around their houses? And again, it's that sort of beauty loss quotient, um, you know, is, is um, you know, sort of sits there. And, and, and for me, I find that one, you know, really curious and, and, and really confronting. Um, but I, I do miss those. I miss my mum, of course, obviously. But um, yes, I also, um, as I was driving past, I missed that um, those families of butcher birds that we we'd known for four to seven years um, in that property as well. When I was away during the fires, um, a number of Australians who I knew who were also overseas were sharing videos of birds mm. for the sound, not for mm. the visuals, but for the feeling of, um, yeah, the. the mm particularly for the sound, magpies and cockatoo. Mm. Mm. We have one question from the audience, which I'll launch into now. Um, that's from Catherine. Uh, Catherine asks if we would speculate about the reasons that Australia has not had a strong tradition of nature writing compared to the US mm. and the UK. Mm. Um, mm. Gee, that's a long, uh, you might want to understand. That's a long answer. Well, <laughs> but, um, uh, look, I think that, Partly, um, 
you know, we've had such a long history of, of Australian nature as being, as, you know, as being perceived as something that we need to overcome or pursue or, or um, conquer um, is, is, you know, is one part of that story. Uh, probably a cultural cringe too in terms of who, who looked at nature in Australia, you know. Um, uh, you know, we... Are we, you know, there's always been that conflict in our literature and our writing of whether we're writing for ourselves, whether we're writing for, you know, for overseas. Um, uh, and, you know, Australia has this double consciousness as well. Um, you know, I hope at least, uh, you know, it's, it's post-colonial era of also there being, a, you know, always that disconnect, the, the what you know, people call the post-colonial uncanny, where, you know, those of us who are settlers are aware that what is at, you know, ours is also not ours, that it's someone else's. And I think all those factors come together, but I think they give us a much more, um, and so literature, uh, our nature writing often tends to happen, you know, in, you know, in histories or in novels or you know in sort of in between sort of spaces that's kind of a feral form that kind of I think mm -hmm. emerges often out of other other sorts of writing or travel writing um, but you know I think that makes it you know really interesting because it's not sort of taking the genre for granted because you can't you know it's a thing in England you know I think the uh, northern America is a different case but in England they don't have that um, you know rich Indigenous history, 60, 65,000 years of, of uh, living, you know, living history, but, you know, um, uh, you know, in such tension with, um, you know, with the Anglo overlay, which we have in Australia, just kind of what my first novel is about in a way, but also, you know, where we did call our mountains, you know, Blue Mountains, um, uh, you know, things like, you know, would name the sites like the ruined castle or Tarpeian Rock because you know <laughs> there was that you know it was so hard to see um, nature and there were so many different ways of seeing it um, from a settler perspective. So I think that's but I think that's that's our great advantage. I think that's the thing that makes our um, mm. our writing so you know so rich and interesting. I find it much more interesting um, yeah. um, to read out of an, an Australian perspective. Um, it certainly seems like the emotional temperature of American nature writing is very lofty and very, you know, comes from that um, history of um, the dispossession of Indigenous people in the States, but the um, for the, the maintenance of national parks, like that was the great kind of innovation in American quote unquote wilderness, you know, the, the idea that there was a, um, a nature that pre-existed, you know, that the, the one could witness alone solitarily that had never been inhabited by anybody this fiction the great fiction of the national parks um and so so as far as i see anyway that there's a kind of appeal to those that democratic kind of idea of the national park um that underlies a lot of american nature writing and then in the uk it's much more spiritual much more kind of traditions of the pastoral, the local, the very first nature writers in Britain were clergymen, literally men. There weren't many women in the tradition at all. Um, and that um, Christian kind of tradition of close monitoring of one's own environs and seeing like God's intention in evolution, sorry, in, in the organism. Um, yeah, we. I don't think we have ever had that. Um, and I also think that Australian writers are much more attuned to cultural relativism and where one can't go, what one can't say. Um, so when an American writer calls for like, it is human nature to want to do X, yeah. I think most Australians would find a little bit of a cringe around the idea of mm. what which human, <laughs> you know. Um, which yeah, so is hopefully we bring a bit more humility to the table. <laughs> well, I think we're just very good yeah. thing, um, in terms of yeah. the challenges ahead of us. But it's also about the readership as well. You know, what are people looking for? Are they are they reading nature writing for a moment of escape? Mm -hmm. You know, is that what they they're looking for? This kind of retreat into away from modernity, away from work, or into a place of green sublimity or are they looking to wrestle with the moral horizon of the environment? Like um yeah so th there's a um and the nascent kind of traditions as well the, the american sorry the australian tradition is just getting started <laughs> i hope 
Mm. And and should be a broad church, you know, like should should have many more people in um mm. yeah in years to come. Um okay, so we're we're approaching the end of our conversation. I'm thinking about the best way to round this out. And and maybe although it kind of haunts all kind of public discourse at the moment, but it is in the book. And that is to close with a question about the pandemic and about um the way that what has happened in the last you know, two and a half years uh, has affected your sense of your, um, the mission of your book, I guess. Mm. Um, yeah, could you talk a little bit about that sense of, you know, what, what you see on the horizon as a result of the pandemic for the environment mm. as a topic in your work? Mm. Um, Ten ton okay. question, I know, to finish on. <laughs> <laughs> it's a question to end, in, in just terms of... Okay, well, and, answer, that, answer that, and, um, and, then, I'll, and then I'll show you, <laughs> tell you something funny to finish. Um, look, I think that, um, you know, the pandemic sort of shown us the best and worst of ourselves in terms of our ability to uh, think communally, uh, to think uh, unselfishly, um, and, uh, you know, we need to, you know, to be able to make, um, you know, to communicate better across, um, you know, across space and time. I guess you think events like this um, are far more sort of accessible. So in those ways, I think there's, I think there's great stuff to, that I hope we hold onto and I hope we don't just go into a, you know, into a, you know, a complete reset. Um, but, you know, I also hope we heed the warning that this is a, uh, you know, this is um, also, uh, you know, the last two years and ongoing have also been, you know, as a result of, um, you know, and, and potentially going to be repeatable result of, of our intrusion on, um, you know, wild spaces as well, that it is part of the unrolling, uh, you know, sort of crisis that we're in, not something that we can overcome and move on to the, you know, the next glamorous location, the next you know, go to the next farmer's market with someone holding a, you know, tomato with the roots um, freshly peeling their hands or some romantic getaway, because what it's shown us is there is no getting away. There is no, there are no points of refuge, as, as the philosopher and the singer has said, and that's the thing that we need to take, I think, um, you know, is that, that sense that we're all in this together and, uh, you know, um, non-human and human, um, and, you know, we, you know, that, that is a, this is a, you know, it's more than a warning shot. It's a, you know, it's a shot through the whole mast of, of um, you know, the sort of the, the, the sort of human and, and uh, non-human ship. And, uh, you know, more to come if we don't, you know, really listen to that, mm. um, to what, what the earth is, you know, what, what the planet is saying, I suppose. Mm. Mm. Well, through all of these layered catastrophes, there will be still not just moments of beauty, but moments of levity. Mm. And I think there was a moment in the book where I really, um, <laughs> I, I felt joined with you in this, in this which is uh, where Delia confesses that she has at times um, gone onto YouTube to look at um, handsome men releasing <laughs> uh, entangled animals from wire fences. <laughs> but that's a particular subgenre of the uh, of the the. Um... We find our pleasures where we can. <laughs> <laughs> and it was something kind of like what rather wonderful to think of that as being like a subgenre of YouTube videos that one might retreat to as a kind of like um, uh, you know animal care and and also. Uh, <laughs> I am not alone. Yeah. I yeah. <laughs> okay, we've hit time. Um, I'm conscious that there are a few other little questions, um, but I'm afraid that we just don't have the time this evening. Um, please do direct them to Delia on Twitter where you can get her um, as well. And I know she's, um, you know, engages in dynamic conversation there as well. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to join with Waverley Council in having this conversation. I thank you very much and um, every best wish. Thank we'll you. Thanks, see you. Thanks. Okay. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.